So welcome, everybody. Um, this is WebAssembly for the Java Geek. This presentation is being completely generated by AI. It's, it's not. I just wanted to ride the hype cycle. Um, so I am Eduardo Vacchi. Maybe you will remember me for some successful blog posts, such as WebAssembly for the Java Geek, on which this presentation is based. And, but actually, who am I? So uh, you can find me online with this uh, handle, Evaki. And uh, I did research about language, programming languages, um, DSLs at University of Milan in Italy. I'm Italian. Uh, that's also why we spell Vaki that way, to confuse the other countries. And uh, I did research and development at Unicredit, then I work at Reddit, uh, Drools, Cogito, especially uh, code generation and a little bit of compilers too. And, uh, and now I've joined this startup called Tetrit, and I work on this WebAssembly runtime called Wazero. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's for Go developers, so it's, this is not the topic of the talk for today. And also, I'm the guy that's standing between you and your lunch, so. <laughs> All right, um, when we talk about WebAssembly with Java developers, uh, the reaction, the immediate reaction tends to be, huh, why cut in the browsers? We had that, it didn't really even work, so what's that? But actually, the reason I'm excited for uh, WebAssembly is not by cutting the browser, but actually WebAssembly on the back end. And that's where they say, really, <laughs> really? Um, so I'm gonna try to argue and convince you that it's something you may want to care about. Uh, let's see if I, I succeed. Now, the other question, but should I care today? And so everyone who cares only if they can deploy WASM to production today, leave the room now. So, but really, should you care today? Probably not. Thank so goodbye, Duke, and thanks for coming to my TED talk. Questions? I'm no, just kidding. So the actual answer is that, obviously, it depends. So we're going to try to, to see when it is useful, why we should, we should care. So uh, one reason probably you may want to use WebAssembly outside the browser is for cross-platform uh, development. So you have an application that runs in the browser. You want to port it on a mobile platform with uh, near native performance of native performance, um, or you want to have a way to run on a cloud platform functions uh, in the language of, of your choice, any language of choice, without resorting to things like native and containers, which are heavier weight. Or another thing that it's uh, useful for, for this kind of platform is being able to extend your application without having to rebuild it. And this is especially useful if the application uh, is complicated to rebuild. You're already thinking, oh, class loaders. I mean it. Wait a minute. So especially when a, a platforms are uh, large and, na and native code, uh, that they're hard to extend. And this platform, WebAssembly platform, is useful in those cases because you can do it using the language of your choice, because it can be targeted but basically any programming language that wants to put some effort in. And also, there are other examples in core data processing. So I put some pictures here, some screenshots. Envoy is a proxy that uses WebAssembly for doing filtering. There was some experiment in Red Panda, which is an implementation of the Kafka protocol that runs native. That supported um, WASM. Uh, data processing in core, and then there are startups and uh, companies that are promoting using WebAssembly for doing edge computing and stuff like that. Wazero, just wanted to mention because it's cool, um, it's uh, being embedded in Dapper, if you've ever heard of that, uh, for doing HTTP middleware and filters, and this is very recent. It's being embedded in Kubernetes in the scheduling part. This is an ongoing effort to support writing custom schedulers without having to recompile uh, all that component of the Kubernetes platform. So that's pretty cool. And there's also companies that are using it to build their own function as a service. Um, so yeah. This is a diagram, this is a picture that I took from another startup called Cosmonic. 
they have their own offering, but um, uh, this is showing that for them, um, WebAssembly outside the browser is a way to evolve beyond uh, containers. And we're going to talk a little bit why people are uh, pitching uh, WebAssembly as an alternative to containers. But before we get there, I want to give you a short history of WebAssembly or a short history of running arbitrary code in the browser, because that's what it is. So I want to bring you back to the 1995, early 2000s, where we already had browsers. We already had the, had the internet, not in the same way we had today, uh, not as ubiquitous, but uh, we had it. And we had browsers, and we had JavaScript in the browsers. And these browsers and this JavaScript, however, um, were much more limited. I mean, uh, these browsers couldn't really play videos, music. If you wanted to do something beyond playing an animated GIF, uh, you had to resort to plugins, which were bits of native code that linked against the core of your browser with all of the issues that that implies, like um, they're native. So they run directly within your browser with the same privileges, um, if they tear down because of a crash, uh, they tear down the entire browser if they crash. So, and if you wanted to deploy them, uh, you, as a developer of a plugin, you had to support all of the CPUs, all of the operating system, all of the web browsers, and all of their versions uh, to, to be able to, to have your user download the plugin and then install them, because your user were in charge. So it was possible to do. I mean, we had to do it to bring more capabilities. Videos, of course, but there's well, there were ob obviously Java applets, Flash player um, animation and, 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 and application and stuff like that. <clears throat> but, um, and, and JavaScript wasn't, still, wasn't yet considered uh, a serious language. It was just for doing button rollovers at that time. Because people didn't really think that JavaScript was worth it. Now, at some point, 2010, about, um, people started to understand that JavaScript was also a language that you could actually use. And there was this book, of course. Um, and so on the one end, we had people that wanted to use JavaScript directly. And there were also people that didn't want to do use JavaScript directly. But that was the one platform that you had deployed everywhere, in every browser on the planet. So if you wanted to use a different language, what could you do? Well, you could compile to JavaScript. Like, use JavaScript as a compilation target instead of a language that you would write. And there were a few. I'm just mentioning just a few, just, uh, you know, GWT, GWT, Google Web Toolkit, probably the first to do it in a mainstream way um, because, well, you could write Java source code and get that compiled into uh, a proper web application with also UI and all that. And then uh, another mainstream language was CoffeeScript. That's now basically dead, but at the time it was a flavor of JavaScript, an extension to JavaScript that compiled to JavaScript. And then, of course, TypeScript, another I wanted to mention because we're still using that. So JavaScript starts to be uh, treated as a compilation target. And so people started to wonder, is there a better way? Can we have a proper compilation target, the compilation target that we deserve? So they start to experiment with a subset of a native executable platform, I mean, having a sandboxed executable platform, and they called that native client. And that was specific to Chrome, however. So uh, Mozilla experimented with defining a subset, a strict subset of the JavaScript language called ASMJS that you could run in a browser, but the browser being equipped at that time uh, now uh, with, with a just-in-time compiler, um, the browser could just turn that JavaScript part, the, the, the subset of JavaScript into native code, efficient native code. And it did a demo uh, with 3D graphics that ran near native performance. So that was it. That was I guess the, the, the point, the turning point, where they say, well, if we can do it using current JavaScript runtimes, um, can we have a proper runtime instead of 
you know, a flavor of JavaScript, and that's what WebAssembly essentially is. It's a proper the, the bytecode that targets browser technologies in a way, um, but people started to get excited um, because of this new technology, because of this new bytecode format that had kind of different features than the, uh, our JVM, for instance, and I'm going to argue and show you what these different features are in good and bad. And, and then after that, people started to wonder, what if we could run it outside the browser to do uh, program extensions or to have proper platforms, proper application written in JavaScript, in uh, WebAssembly? So again, when a Java developer look at WAMS, they still, mm, is this the JVM? So uh, from, a, from a certain perspective, it could look like it is. Like their source code that gets turned into bytecode, right? It's a stack-based VM, so OK. Uh, the JVM is also a bold, can also run both on the client and the server. And the bytecode is interpreted, but then it gets uh, JIT compiled into efficient native code. So, and that's also what you can do with WebAssembly. So they're the same. But there's one key difference. As I said, um, WebAssembly was born uh, with the objective of being able to target it from a compiler. People were targeting ASMJS from native compilers, C, C++ compilers. So they wanted a platform that could be, tar that could, uh, be targeted by lower, uh, in a lower level way. And Java Bytecode was never really meant to be a general purpose compilation target. So this is, this is um, I actually have sources for that, for instance, this paper. This paper, Bytecode's Mid Combinators Invoke Dynamic on the JVM, introduces for the first time the Invoke Dynamic instruction, which is nowadays being used also for Lambdas. But at the time, it was specifically introduced to support uh, dynamic languages such as Groovy, JRuby, Jiden. And it says in the abstract, the JVM, was designed for just one language, Java. And so when it is used to express programs in other source languages, there are often pain points. So I'm not saying this. It's John R. Rose, OK, from, the JDK, from Sun Microsystems and now Oracle. There is this quote uh, that is often uh, represented because Solomon Hikes is the creator of Docker, so that's why it's significant. He says, if WASM, WebAssembly, and WASI, we're going to talk later about what WASI is, but these two feet, WebAssembly existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. That's how important it is. WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. A standardized system interface was the missing link. Let's hope WASI is up to the task. That's what WASI is, a standardized system interface. We're going to talk about that later. So um, first of all, your reaction may be, what the hell are you talking about, Solomon? This Docker is about containerization, sandboxing. What has WebAssembly to do with that? And, and in fact, someone also argued on Twitter, because you know, Twitter is the place when you can have nuanced discussion. Uh, what about the JVM? And it was like, yeah, yeah, there is the JVM. It could be, be that ubiquitous runtime for all application, regardless of language, but it's not. And Wasm is trying again. Maybe it will succeed this time. Another point, Thomas, who's the lead for GraalVM, was like, and what about GraalVM? And Solomon was like, uh, yeah, yeah. And then, then, then so there's two. Uh, there's two projects that are trying to do a big runtime. So that's even better. Like, crap. So now, as a Java developer looking at Wasm, you could be saying, like, uh, so is this GraalVM? And now you're making Thomas upset. Also, Lena is looking at you disappointed. <laughs> so, indeed, GraalVM uh, was and is meant to be the one VM to rule them all. This is one of the seminal papers, I would say, not the first, but one of the seminal and most interesting paper, really approachable, actually, about GraalVM. The goal for GraalVM was to be a polyglot platform. And a, one of the goals for WebAssembly is also to be kind of a polyglot platform in that any language, any compiler can target it. So what's the difference? Why are they not the same? Why are we not bringing GraalVM to the browser? 
Well, if you take a look, this is, this is not something that I came up with. This is a proper documentation from the GraalVM website, and it's been pitched a lot of times. This is how GraalVM, and I'm not saying native image, because GraalVM is an umbrella of projects. So native image is the one that compiles to native. GraalVM is the umbrella. This is the GraalVM, Hotspot, and Truffle compilers. So on the, on the bottom, you have the Hotspot VM, the usual VM. And then there's the Graal compiler that takes the role of the JIT compiler that we usually have on Hotspot, C1, C2, and so on. Um, this role is played instead in the Graal distribution by the Graal compiler, which is pretty interesting in its own way for several reasons, but we're not going to talk about that today. And then on top of that, there's the Truffle framework. So on top of the Graal compiler, you can run regular Java language, uh, regular JVM languages such as Java and Scala that can pass down to bytecode. But the Truffle framework does a little bit more. Uh, it allows you to run dynamic languages with near native performance, or at least with very, very cool, very um, compelling performance, uh, but writing it in a very high level way using just the abstract syntax tree. We're not going to deal with that, those details, but this is the reason why Graal VM is, a, is the one VM to rule them all. It's because it's a polyglot platform where all of this language can interoperate. So why are we not bringing this to the browser? Let's take a little bit, talk a little bit about our architecture of, uh, of the WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a structured stack machine. It's not just a stack machine like the JVM. Um, it, is a, it is a machine where most computations use stack of values, but some instructions are structured. You cannot do jumps around in your, uh, in your code or in your uh, body of a method. While you can do that in bytecode, you can only do ifs, uh, structure loops, blocks. Let's see a few examples. So on the, on the left, you have JVM bytecode. On the right, you have uh, the WebAssembly textual representation. And at the top, we have an expression. So x plus 2 times 3. x is a variable. So let's say x value is 4. 4 plus 2 is? Six, good. Paying attention. Uh, <laughs> and six times three is 18, good. You're paying attention. So let's see, <laughs> let's see how this works being translated into Java bytecode. And you'll see also WebAssembly bytecode. So first you load the value for variable x. So in this case, the first variable, I load one. So value for x, it's four. So you push four on the stack. Then you load the constant value true, two. You push two on the stack. Now on the stack, we have four and two, and then we have add. And add pops two instructions from the stack, four and two, and pushes the result, which is six, six on the stack. <laughs> now you push the constant three, and in the stack, you have six and three. Now you have mole. Mole pops three, three, two uh, values from the stack, which are six and three, pushes 18 on the, on the stack, and that's the result. As you can see, it's the same exact extraction on the left and the right. So this, this is not working in, in my favor, right? It's exactly the same. Um, but um, let's look at then structure control flow at, at, at control flow. If we look at um, this very simple if, we have an X, a Boolean X, and then we print one if it's true and zero otherwise. Not a very fancy program, but it's just for, um, for uh, showing the point. Anyway, are there any cats in the audience? No, okay, good. Uh, so, um, so as you can see here, if equal, it's a, it's a jump. It's a, it's a conditional jump, but you can jump anywhere. And it says jumps to 14 here. And then there's this instruction here, go to, which is an unconditional branch. So there's no, not even an if before that. So, the, so you, it just says, if you reach this point, you just jump to 21. So what's wrong with this? Oh, and let's take a look with, uh, to, 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 to WebAssembly instead. You can see that there is proper if, then, and else blocks. This is the nested representation. The actual representation inside the bytecode is not, it doesn't have nested parentheses, but still, it, it still has these block structures, the else and the end. So you cannot just do jumps anywhere. In the, in the Java bytecode, you could jump even backwards. 
Um, and the reason why we don't want that is because it makes harder verification of the code. So JVM bytecode verification takes more than 150 pages to describe, while WebAssembly only takes one page. It took a decade of research to hash out the details of a correct JVM verification. JVM, the CIL, which is the .NET uh, runtime, and a common, uh, common interface language, I don't remember, and Android Dolvik. Uh, all, all of them allow to create irreducible loops that can, uh, that can basically trip out and uh, make the JIT confused. And the JIT gives up and doesn't generate any more efficient code, which is something we definitely don't want. So that's another reason why they are different and why we're not just using JVM. Um, WebAssembly instead offers compro representation, efficient validation and compilation, safe low to no overhead execution. This is not something I'm just came in, uh, coming up with. This is from a paper, bringing the web up to speed with WebAssembly, PLDI 17. Uh, PLDI is one of the premier conference, uh, academic conferences for programming language research, and it was the first paper that talked about WebAssembly. And, uh, and besides, WebAssembly is not committing to a specific programming model. It supports it potentially supports any language. Um, it's an abstraction over modern hardware as compared to the JVM, which was biased towards uh, Java. Uh, and it's thus language hardware platform independent, which makes it well suited for use cases beyond the web, which is our point. Another thing that I want to talk about is boot up time. So uh, this is from Dan Idingus, lead of OpenJ9 uh, talk, starting fast. So uh, when you start a J an J JVM application, uh, even before you get to your static void main, uh, you have at least three class loaders. About 100 classes need to be loaded. And about 160 static initialization routines have to be executed. Static initialization is basically code that is inside every class, potentially any class and has to be executed as soon as you use that class. Um, now, suppose that you use a, a framework for your applications. You probably do. Um, for instance, Spring. Now, you have more class loader, maybe hundreds of class loader. You have definitely more classes, like thousands of classes for the framework to work. And then you may have a thousand of static initializers. Now it's the turn of your code, the actual code, and now you have even more class loaders, even more classes, even more static initializers. So this is not necessarily bad. There's, uh, there are trade-offs, but there are, there are a lot of things that you need to, be, to, to do before you actually reach to a, a, a state where the JVM starts to do the work. And at the very least, you are here. Right before you actually start, that's the boot of your application, uh, the boot of your VM. This is the boot of your application. Sta class initializers, and I don't want to go into the details of bytecode for that, but just give you an example. This is pretty innocent program. Hello, hello world. Okay, system out print LN. and yet you have a string constant that you need to load. Do you have to resolve a method in order to invoke it? And that method is a method invocation over a print stream. But actually, that belongs to a field, and you have to know the type of that field and the runtime type of the field because of late binding, inheritance, da 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 da, to know its actual type and to know the actual implementation of the method that you have to execute. And then, out is a field, and it's a static field of a class. And that field has to be initialized, and then gets initialized by a static initializer. So even this very simple program actually involves quite a few things. And that's why, for instance, native image takes quite a while to compile your program, because it needs to take into account all of these things that happen in a JVM at startup time so that it can move those to build time 
and uh, make your startup faster. So it, uh, it has to analyze your code, definitely, but it also analyzes the layout of the objects in memory in order to take a snapshot of only those objects that have to stay in the native image at runtime. So that's a lot of work. So do Wasm VM boot up fast? Well, sure, but I don't do as much stuff as a JVM anyway. So they just uh, start, and that's already ready to work. And then when you load a module, they validate the module. They compile the module usually into some representation, maybe even native code. And then the module may have an init, an init function, which is basically kind of like the static initializer for classes. And that's it. And consider that usually you don't initialize more than one module at a time for an application. So that really is it. And so if we compare JVM and WebAssembly, there are other differences. Uh, but we mentioned already language bias, hardware bias. There's also the fact that the OpenJDK uh, is tiered by Oracle and the OpenJDK project, while WebAssembly is a W3C project. There are other differences, though. Um, in the JVM, the languages share the object model, the GC, and the standard library. While in WebAssembly, other languages bring their own object model, their garbage collection if they want to use it, and standard library. If you don't want to call it garbage collection, you can call it allocator and deallocator, because it could be manual. Speaking of that, there should be something playing here, but whatever. So linear memory. Um, Basically, linear memory is just a, a big slab, a big byte array, and that's it. Use it. You can allocate memory, deallocate memory, and you're, you're on your own. That's what WebAssembly currency currently gives you. Um, so you allocate, you can deallocate. Basically, it's kind of like if you had only off-heap memory in JVM terms. And there is a GC spec, but it's very experimental. So, oh, <laughs> it didn't load. Uh, too bad. So other limitations, besides no gar automated garbage collector. Uh, there's no p-threads. You don't have really threads outside the browser, especially. Um, you don't have exception handling. This is experimental. You can stack walk. You can unwind the stack uh, in an automated way. You can implement your own mechanism to do that stuff. So if you crash and you want to throw an exception and get back to, you know, unwind the stack, go back to the player to another place and handle the, the exception. You can do that, but you have to do kind of manually. There's no basically no dynamic module loading. There's no virtual calls. There's no object orientation built in in the VM. You, you have to roll your own if you want to do virtual uh, calls. So does it really boot up fast? Well, as you saw, the VM is pretty bare bone. So it means that you compile everything that you need. So if you want a GC, sure, bring your own. Um, do you want to run Python? Well, you could compile the interpreter and then interpret inside WebAssembly. So the module may become very heavyweight. And because, because it becomes heavyweight, it may need to do some things during initialization, and that could take some time for your boot up time. So does it really boot up fast? Well, eh, it depends on your module, really. So a WebAssembly runtime is just like a JVM, except it doesn't come with a standard library. Uh, it, it, it doesn't come with object orientation. Um, it doesn't do dynamic class loading. Um, it doesn't do garbage collection in an automated way. Uh, there's no p-threads. There's no exception handling. You, can do, you cannot do stack walking. You cannot do stack unwinding. And also, it has a different instruction format. So sure, it's basically the same thing, um, except all of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, standard libraries, because as I said, there's no standard library, but that's not totally correct. There, there are efforts. The VM comes with nothing. And in the browser, you will have that, just the barebone VM. But there are efforts to standardize a set of APIs that could be everywhere. And one of the efforts is WASI, probably the most important effort so far. 
Um, so the idea for WASI, which was the name for WebAssembly System Interface, now they're kind of refitting the acronym to call it WebAssembly Standard Interfaces, but that's not important. The idea is that um, they, were, they are trying to come up with a flavor of POSIX, so a, send a, a set of uh, standard functions that you could expect to be everywhere in all runtimes, so that you can target those. But these are low-level primitives. We're going to see those. Uh, the, the difference with POSIX, which is the, you know, the, the, the set of APIs that powers most Unix -based, well, all Unix-based uh, operating systems, is that it's capability-oriented. What, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, I also have this slide. So the reason for this is that definitely you can run WebAssembly and interface with the operating system through a browser, but then you have to run through some JS glue code, then have the browser go uh, and call the actual kernel. You could use Node.js and wrap your WebAssembly module inside some JS glue code, but still your WebAssembly module is, is far from the actual operating system because there's the, this glue code in the middle. So that's the place that was uh, fits in. So the idea is that um, this set of APIs is not just POSIX, because POSIX gives you uh, access to the entirety of your operating system. What we instead we want to do is give it just visibility to a part of your operating system, to a, to a view of your operating system. We want all of your executable, uh, all of your executables to run in a, in a sandbox. So when people hear sandbox, of course, they hear, oh, like Docker. And that's why people think container and WebAssembly, because it's a way to contain your applications. So how does that work? Well, basically, instead of just letting your um, programs access any part of the operating system, such as the file system, you give them a view of it. So you cannot just do, let's uh, take a look at dot dot ATC password and walk through the, um, the, the, the uh, tree of your file system, um, because maybe you just gave your application a view that is just that subtree of the file system. So you cannot do uh, dot dot ATC uh, password because you cannot access to that. Or you cannot open a port because you didn't give network capabilities to that executable, just like you do with Docker, in a way. So that's why it kind of feels similar to, to containers. Other, other uh, initiatives are WASIX, which is a very recent new uh, extension to WASI that, gives, um, that implements more POSIX and POSIX-like uh, APIs. And then there's component model, which is a bit of a more future kind of thing. Um, the idea is that people can publish their APIs in modules that they call uh, words. And then runtimes can support several of these words, and every module can decide to implement which words. Um, and this interface, they, they basically define an interface definition language that calls WIT. Um, with the idea that it could open, uh, pave the way for uh, interop between languages. That's the, the idea. So there are already quite a few languages that support WASM. This is not in any way a complete picture. There are, there are many more, uh, at least in a very experimental state. There are compiled languages such as C, C++, Rust, Zig, uh, Go, and, with, and then TinyGo. Uh, there are interpreted languages that bring their own interpreter, so they compile the interpreter to, to WebAssembly. And then there's hybrid techniques like .NET C Sharp that brings the interpreter, but I think they also optimize that to be reduced in a way. And the list is growing. But we're here to talk about Java. So I wanted to give you an overview of the Java landscape on, on, on WebAssembly. And if we spare some minutes, I also have a very tiny, tiny demo. Um, GraalVM native image. So nothing. There's no announcement there. There's only just one blog post that is actually about RISC-V. And in the last few lines of the blog post, they say, well, we did RISC-V through LLVM. They re we are using LLVM to compile uh, Java bytecode into uh, LLVM representation. LLVM supports many 
uh, backends, so it supports many compilation targets. One of them is RISC-V, and that's how we had the RISC-V support. That took surprisingly a relatively small amount of time, six months. So WebAssembly is one of the supported uh, compilation targets for LLVM. So who knows? Maybe. That's not much, but yeah, OK. Let's stay tuned. Um, Scala native have their, uh, so Scala have this flavor of the Scala compiler that's called Scala native. Uh, outside the Scala community, probably not very widely known, but it exists. And um, they have their own tool chain that targets LLVM directly. So it's not based on GraalVM at all. So the way this works is that um, basically they generate code that targets LLVM, and then this, uh, this code is compiled into native in all the architectures that are supported through LLVM. Now, they also are able to support uh, WebAssembly. Because, I mean, in an experiment. They're, they experimented with it because the work is relatively uh, small. Again, they also note that there's no exception handling and there's no standard or, or, or uh, um, final GC specification. So, still very experimental. Another experimental project that I wanted to mention is uh, Kotlin. Kotlin also have their own. Um, uh, compilation tool chain, so they can target JVM, of course. They could target JavaScript since the early days, uh, and they recently added more targets, especially they also had the native support, again, I think through LLVM, and recently uh, they also started to experiment with WebAssembly as well. And one of the examples is to be able to, for instance, uh, build native applications for mobile. Well, native, WebAssembly-based uh, applications for mobile. But again, this WebAssembly uh, flavor that they're targeting requires a lot of extensions, a lot of uh, proposals that are not finalized, and so it only runs in browsers, and I think not even all of the browsers, but yet. It's interesting. GWT, do you remember GWT? It's back in Jekyll form. Uh, J2CL is the name of uh, the most recent version of the GWT compiler. And this is a compiler from source code to JavaScript, but recently it also had some experimental support for WebAssembly in the browser. So that's interesting as well. Now, these are other projects that you probably never heard of. One is Bytecoder. This is very promising, but it's mostly targeted in the browser. But it's, uh, it's actually uh, impressive because they can run uh, Java 2D simulation inside the browser without applets. That's pretty cool. Um, another project that's similar is J WebAssembly. But the project that I wanted to show you and for which I have a demo, let, let's see if I have enough time to show you, uh, it's TVM. And TVM is another tool chain that compiles bytecode into JavaScript, but also WebAssembly. And the particular feature that is interesting about TVM is that it is able to target WASI. So it doesn't just run in the browser, but also outside the browser, which is useful for language extensions and stuff like that. This is another project that uh, it's proprietary, but it's impressive, Java Fiddle. Um, it's powered by ChirpJ, by this company, Leaning Technologies. It's a bunch of actually Italian guys, as far as I can tell from the names, even though they're not living in Italy. And they're doing this uh, powerful platform for compiling and running uh, Java bytecode on top of WebAssembly. They have a proper JDK that runs in the browser, and they also support Swing, which is pretty useful if you have legacy applications. Maybe not for forward development, but if you have uh, old application that you cannot really change, that's kind of impressive. So this is their website. They also have an applet runner as a Chrome extension. It's pretty cool. And uh, they do pretty interesting stuff, like running an entire Linux system virtualized in the browser. It's pretty cool. Other technologies. Was among Java. So how to do the reverse? Um, there's definitely GraalVM that supports running on top of Truffle WebAssembly. So you can run WebAssembly on top of the JVM if you want through Truffle and GraalVM. And then there's a few projects that are able to uh, compile uh, WebAssembly bytecode into Java bytecode but, or, or run it as an interpreter, but they're kind of uh, experimental and sometimes even outdated. So that's uh, 
the state. So what about runtimes? Once you mention again Wazero, of course, because I work on it and because it's cool. Um, if you happen to do Go development, check it out. It has some particular features that are very specific and useful for Go developers, but there are definitely other runtimes. Most famous, probably Wasm time, which is uh, the one uh, support, one of the runtimes supported by the Bytecode Alliance, Wammer as well. There are others, Wasm Cloud, Wasm Edge, uh, Wasmer, and Wasm Free. Uh, Wasm time and Wasmer have, I mean, have somewhat some sort of support uh, to embed inside a JVM through JNI, and uh, I think they're from third parties. However, but if you need to run WebAssembly on top of the JVM, you can do that uh, through this project right now. Another way could be using Xtism, which is a plugin system that uses WebAssembly and wraps in a nicer API uh, these runtimes. I think it uses well some time under the hood, still using JNI, not JVM. So finally, should I care today? So as a Java developer, unfortunately, support is still limited unless you are developing using one of those languages that have some uh, their own support, like Scala or Kotlin. Um, it's definitely different than targeting Java as a platform because it has some set of constraints that are different. It's more like targeting native image uh, because the set of constraints that you have on, the, uh, on that VM are completely different from the one on the JVM. But suppose you have to write an Envoy filter and you don't want to learn Tiny Go, then having the choice is nice. Um, yeah. When you make care, again, uh, if you want to support language extensions in general, especially if you're not controlling the, the host. So if the host environment, so, it's not something you control, if it's not a JVM, uh, that's something interesting. Being able to target through compilation uh, the JVM, uh, JVM languages, running it uh, uh, anywhere else uh, on a WebAssembly runtime. Uh, and yeah. Or if you want to run in a constrained environment, it's kind of similar. Or if you want, I don't know, develop a function as a service with low overhead, there's a bunch of use cases. Pros and cons. There's low overhead, but of course there are caveats, as we explained, as we discussed. It's a pay what you need cost model. The VM is bare bone, but if you bring stuff, you will pay for it, and you will pay for it. So. Be aware. So don't believe the hype. If you roll your own GC, bring your entire interpreter, you will definitely pay a cost. But then, should you care about this now? Well, maybe. Should you care about this in the future? Possibly. I would say probably. Should you keep an eye on it? I think so. So thank you for staying with me so far, and uh, hope you like. So. Uh, so we still have seven minutes, so we, I, I can take questions or I can show you the demo. If you have any questions, I can answer the questions, otherwise I can go straight to the demo and then if we have time left. Show me the demo. All right, bonus demo. Write a microservice in five minutes with Go, WebAssembly, and Wazero. The Wazero part is not really important. Uh, okay, suppose you have this program, um, very simple hello world program, and the common line you write hello, and it will print hello world, okay, pretty, pretty common. And then you have uh, hello, and we dispense the syntax, you pass the name, uh, toolbox, hello toolbox, these are old slides, should say J Nation. Um, anyway, and then this is your main. Uh, you parse the arguments with that strange syntax, and then you print hello and the name. That's how it works. Now, suppose that you also add this weird line, which weirdly looks like uh, an header, an HTTP header. Uh, if you compile your program, it will do something like that. Content type text plain, hello world, content type text plain, hello devox. Whoa, this, this, these lines are a mess. OK, let me go quickly here and show you that it's actually working like this. So zero run, well, this is already WebAssembly. <laughs> yeah, let's not spoil the surprise. Anyway, 
Now, what if I told you that by taking this executable, I could turn this into a web application by the magic of CGI, or as some people call it, serverless, legacy serverless. <laughs> so CGI was a technology for, uh, I mean, if you, know, if you don't know that, it was a technology to run, basically run executables uh, and expose them on the web. So by doing that, what you can uh, do is turn this application into an actual web application and actually responds to, uh, to the um, query parameters. And that's why the strange syntax for the parameters. So um, how it works, it's really cool because it's a very simple model. So you just pass program arguments, standard output, standard input, and environment variables, and then you can turn every program which is able to do that into an actual web application. So uh, the cons for the CGI model are that it runs at the same privileges of uh, the web server. So each request spawns a new process. You can do a denial of service that way. Uh, there's no control over capabilities. There's no sandboxing. And that's where, and that's when you think, ah, Docker, right? Or, or Wasi. So that's where these comes into play. Uh, you can actually run uh, you can actually run a simple executable that reads from standard input and writes, uh, reads from standard input, writes a standard output, reads environment variables, uh, read the uh, arguments, but instead you run in a constrained environment in a, some sort of containerized environment. So the idea here is we compile our executables to WebAssembly, we can still use any programming language including Java with TVM, and we virtualize the arguments. So let's see how that looks. This is our Hello World program. It looks exactly how you would expect. And I have downloaded TVM. Um, they have already configured uh, an, uh, an example for you. And basically, all they do in this uh, Gradle build is they had some TVM plugin that configures the WASM with WASI uh, target, compilation target. So as you can see, I can now run this program inside was zero, because it's my favorite uh, WebAssembly runtime outside the browser. But I can also write uh, a host application using Go, in this case, that uses was zero as a library to virtualize standard input and standard output. And the result is that I no longer print anything here, um, except that I'm listening on some port. And then there we are. And then it's responding to localhost. And now, if I say actually J Nation, it will say, hello, J Nation. Applause. <laughs> All right. Um, so, and the way it works, it's really simple. Uh, in the case of WebSM, it's really, really, uh, in the case of uh, Wazero, it's really simple. You would write, in Go, in this case, obviously, an handler function for an HTTP request. And then you just instantiate your session, which in under the hood is instantiated with zero. And the way it works, you can really think of it just like if it were Java. Standard output takes a reader instance. Standard input takes a writer instance. Uh, buffered input reader, da 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 da. And um, instead of reading from the actual standard input and standard output, you're actually passing in virtual streams. And so uh, the WebAssembly module will think that it's running uh, against system out and system in, and instead, in arguments, and instead uh, they're, being, they're being faked. This is actually something that people do in WebAssembly. It's not just some weird thing, even though it's kind of weird. Uh, and that's how it works. So. And that's right. It took me longer to explain Wagi than actually showing you the code. So. That's it.